Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here with you today. I'm, I'm excited to share with you today from God's Word. Um, I, I got I to gotta start, though, by telling you a story. So one of my wife and I's favorite activities to do just like as we're, we're about to head to bed or something like that, we'll, we'll often just look over a bunch of pictures of our babies. And how many of you guys know that all babies are cute? Well, most babies are cute. All babies at Calvary Assembly are cute. You can write that down on your note sheet there today. That's your first fill in the blank, not really. Um, and if you don't believe that my babies are cute, there are exits here, 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 all sorts of exits for you to leave today. No, I'm just kidding. All are welcome in the house of the Lord. Okay. But here's the thing is uh, one of the things we love to do is look at like when they were babies, here are the features that they had. So you can see my son and his buddy and you can start to see like the features of his face, his nice little chubby cheeks there uh, that, that are still present here today. And you can see the same with my daughter. It's true as well for her that, I mean, come on now, that's, that's, just, that's just too much. And that's with her little friend, and as they grew up together, they, they're friends here from church, which is awesome that they're cultivating those relationships uh, right now, even as we're in here. But I want to I turn the corner, I want to turn the page and actually get serious for a moment here, because my concern for some of us is not in a physical sense, but some of us look like we did in our past. We look like the pain that we've carried from before. It's like our lives have been defined by our mistakes, and we're continuing to look like we once did. Maybe our, our, our spiritual growth or who we are has been stunted, and, and some of it's by, by things that we've done, mistakes we've made in the past, and some of it's from, from things other people did to us. But our, but our past is determining our present and therefore defining where we can go in our future. So my question for us today is, what happens to us if we don't actually wrestle through our past, the things that have happened to us or that we've done wrong? What happens to us? And, and what, might me, what might we be missing out on if we don't step into the opportunities because we are stuck in the past? I think that God's word is going to have some great things to share with us today uh, to, to help us answer that question. Before we go into his word, would you just pray with me briefly? God, by the power of your spirit, would you speak to us today? Would you make your word be alive and active in our hearts? We come open to you. Amen. Amen. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up to Joshua chapter 1. We're, we're in a series where we're studying uh, the book of Joshua as we talk about what is next for us. And uh, we're going to jump right in and then we'll dissect this passage together. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 9. Here's what it says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. So 
here's the thing. I, I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of the Israelite people, and first in the shoes of Joshua. So, so these people have had this, this amazing leader in Moses. He's been so faithful. They've, they've been so grateful for where he has led them. But he has now passed, and he's, he's passing the torch down to Joshua. And so Joshua's got a big task because these Israelite people, when they're getting this word, they, they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. I mean, they've, they've been stuck for a really long time just wandering and wandering and wandering. And so Joshua's got this big task to take them into what God has promised them. But you got to imagine what he's feeling. Like, man, i got to step into this guy's shoes. He's got to be feeling fear, anxiety, doubt. Am I good enough to do this? He's got to be wrestling with those things. And then you got to think about the Israelite people, too, who he's about to lead into this promised land, what they might have been thinking about. Because for me, if I'm somebody who's just wandered in a desert for 40 years, I'm pretty ticked. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, come on now. I mean, if, if I was, I, I feel like I'd be asking, like, Moses, are you sure you heard from the Lord on this? Like, I, I trust in you, I believe in you, but man, it's been a long time since that's come to fruition here. And I mean, these are the questions I feel like I would have been asking. I would have been like, Moses, were you just dead wrong? And these are the, these are the same st sorts of questions I think that the Israelites needed to wrestle down and think through and talk through. For myself, I actually had the privilege to visit Israel earlier this year, and it was a great trip, an awesome time. And one of the exercises that we did actually was uh, we went out to the desert um, in, in Israel, and um, we, what we did is we were not allowed to talk to anybody for one hour, and basically we just sat there and were pretty quiet or we walked around in just a little area. I even saw like a legit shepherd with sheep out there, so that was interesting. I didn't, apparently that's still a thing. And uh, so, so we're, uh, we're out there and man, by the end of one hour, I was spent like physically spent, and I'm not that out of shape, church, come on, <laughs> go to the gym every once in a while, um, probably could use a few more trips, but I digress, okay, so, but, but we did, and so at the end of one hour, we get back onto the air-conditioned bus, and we're drinking our water, because, man, after one hour, it, that, was, that was enough for us, they've done this for 40 years now, Whew. I, an hour, the Lord knew that was all I could handle, so that's all he gave to me. But for the Israelites, you got to think about it. They had to wrestle down their doubts, their disappointments of wandering for 40 years. They, they had to really say, I, I'm angry. They had, even they had been disobedient. And now the, the next generation that walks in, walks into the promises and believes in God and believes it's true, and they get to inhabit the promised land. But this is the same thing for us that we've got to do, just like those Israelites back then, is we, might, we have doubts and fears that are holding us back from what God intends for us. And God wants to allow us to step in to freedom. That's what he wants for us. But these doubts and these fears are affecting every sphere of our life, our interactions, our marriages, our friendships, even, even our work potential. It's affecting our spheres if we've got doubts and fears of where God is trying to take us. I think about um, my son who you saw in the, in the picture there. He, uh, he just started taking Taekwondo, so watch your back. <laughs> um, and he does kind of tear through that lobby, so <laughs> watch your back for multiple reasons because he might run into you. But... Um, my son has just started taking this up, and, and uh, he really loves Taekwondo. But every time we show up, every Monday night, I take him up there, and we, there's, like a, there's chairs for the parents to sit in to watch. And every time we show up, him and I sit down on the chairs, and all the other kids are out there playing. So I'm like, hey, buddy, go on out. Go, go play. Go get warmed up. Kick, chop, whatever you want to do. And every time, he's like, no, 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 no. And he kind of sits there and he snuggles up against me. And he, he's, 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 a little, he's too afraid. He's, he's too timid. And he's on the younger side of the class. And so um, he, he just is, is too afraid to get in. But then the instructor comes and says, Will, come stand at attention. He's, yes, sir. You know, he gets all into it. And he loves it. He has the time of his life. 
But I wonder how many of us this is true for too, where we're, we're sitting on the sidelines. We haven't stepped into the game of what God wants to invite us to because we're too scared. We're just too nervous. We're thinking about all of our past disappointments, all the things that have gone wrong when we tried to take a risk, when we tried to step into something. And I think this fear has incredible ramifications and implications for our lives. I just got to be honest and transparent with you for a minute. Even this week, as I thought about standing up here to be able to talk to you today, I had some real fears and anxieties. And, and honestly, like, it's not even like a typical thing. Like, I usually feel like a little bit of nervousness, but this was like way, way, way more um, than I've experienced in the past to the point where uh, three nights this week, I was up for two hours just like staring at my clock. <laughs> and it was not a pleasant experience. But for me, I, I honestly, I really had to wrestle down and say, am I going to let fear affect an opportunity that God has given to me? And, and I'm grateful today to stand on the promise of God and say, this isn't my own strength, this isn't my own courage. I stand on him and who he has said I am, that I am enough because of him. It, I, he doesn't love me because of what I do. He loves me because I'm his child. So I'm grateful for that, and that's the confidence I stand in. And, and I can tell you, I feel peace, and I feel free from that, but I had to wrestle that down. I could have sent Pastor Bob that text and be like, mm, not feeling so good. How about, how about you go on up there, huh? But what could I have missed out on? This is so true for all of us, all the time. Are we going to get past the fears? Are we going to get past the doubts? in our lives that are holding us back from the opportunities that God has for us. So I want you to start thinking about and start wrestling through what are some of the things in my life? What are some of the fears? What are some of the doubts that I have that are holding me back from my God-given potential? Potential, Because here's the thing about God. God doesn't leave us on our own. God didn't leave the Israelites on their own. God gave the Israelites resources, and he gives us resources too. For the Israelites, he provided for their physical needs. He, he brought them manna each day, okay? But he also gave them spiritual resources. That's why in, in verses, uh, you know, that we just read, Joshua 1, 6 through 9, it says, meditate on the book of the law. Meditate on God's word. Know what it says. Don't veer from it to the right or to the left. Stay true to it. And here's Here's part of my concern today is God has given us an incredible spiritual resource that we can have access to at any time of any day, and we're not taking advantage of it. It's sitting there on the shelf collecting dust. God's got all these wonderful promises, lessons, things he wants to teach us to help us grow in our faith and in our lives, and we're not even accessing the power of his word. Church, I want to challenge us in this today. Maybe for you, what this looks like, like for me, I, I, read, I read on my phone. I have a Bible app. That's where I do even like my devotionals and stuff, right through the YouVersion Bible app. It's got all sorts of great resources. Start your day with the Lord. Let, let's do just like he has asked us. Because if not, I'm, I'm fearful, or I'm concerned, I should say, that we could be missing out on the power that we could have access to. Things like this that, that, that God's word says that, that are promises, but we're not actually walking into. Things that say like, you are fearfully and wonderfully made is what God says about you. Amen? Amen. But so many of us are looking in the mirror and seeing all these insecurities and seeing how I don't measure up, how I'm not enough, how that person is so much better than me, or sometimes even vice versa, how I'm better than that other person. And we start to compare rather than saying, I am made in the image of God like his word says about us. How does that affect every one of our lives and interactions? Or, or how about this? You are forgiven. You see, we're, we're so stuck thinking about our past and our past disappointments and the things we've done wrong. And we say, God, you couldn't use me. Or, you know, I'll just kind of stay in this little box, this safe little place. I'm not going to take risks for God, I'm, I can't anymore 
But God is saying, you are forgiven. Your sin is wiped clean, white as snow. It's like this one passage says, it's tossed into the bottom of the ocean. The bottom of the ocean is dark. You can't see anything. It's gone. It's forgiven. You are forgiven when you accept Christ into your life. You are made white as snow. Amen? Amen. And, and here's another promise that he gives to us that we have access to every single day. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, I am with you wherever you go. Man, that, that's one of my favorite concepts in all of Scripture. And it's true. It's true. When you accept Jesus and you make him Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. And what God's word says is that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There is nothing. These are powerful truths we have access to. What if we started writing these truths on our hearts on a daily manner? How would that affect our lives? How would that affect the people around us who are hurting and who are hopeless? What if we had words of truth and encouragement and peace and hope to speak over people's lives because we had written this on our hearts? There's a lot at stake, my friends. It's why... It's why I even think about this passage where it's, what it's most famous for is that strong and courageous because it comes back to it three times in that, just that short little bit that we, we read. Be strong and courageous. And the, the final one says, have I not commanded you? It's like, seriously, I've already told you this two times. <laughs> have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And here's the thing is, that is a command that he's giving, but God also gives us this as a provision. God gives us strength and courage. See, see what strength really is, is, is the ability to accomplish what God has put in front of you by trusting and leaning into him. And, and the potential is so much greater than if we just try to do it on our own strength. We can do this much, but with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. So, the, so, so strength is the energy required to fulfill something. And for courage... See, we, we think about courage as being fearlessness. Like a courageous person, they don't, they don't experience fear. No, a courageous person, person pushes through the fear. Regardless of how I act, what's going on inside of me, I'm going to be courageous because the Lord, my God, is my strength. He is my courage. That's where I find my hope, my strength is in him. So look at your life. What are you putting your hope and your strength into? Is it in just your own abilities and what you can accomplish? Are you turning to God? Are you trusting in him? Are you leaning into him? Are you, are you asking him for guidance, for strength, for courage, for wisdom? Because his spirit is alive and well, and it's real, and it lives inside of you. Man, that's, that's a hope for us today, is that he is with us. But so, so God, God wants us to be a people who can walk in victory by the power of his Holy Spirit because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. But in order for us to walk in victory, this is super important. We have to deal with our past, right? Like, so, the, so the Israelites had to deal with their past disappointments, the things in, in their life that had gone wrong, that, that they wished would have gone differently. And God when, when God made the promise to Moses on Mount Sinai, he wanted to bring the Israelite people in earlier. He really did. But they weren't ready yet. They, they didn't believe they were being disobedient. They, they had to wrestle that all through. And then the next generation was able to walk into the promised land. And I think for us, we've got to deal with our past disappointment. Otherwise, we may limit our potential and where God can take us to. Not because of God, but because we haven't done our hard heart work in our own lives. There's a, a leading uh, philosophical uh, ph philosopher, thinker. His name is Friedrich Nietzsche. You, you might have heard of him. Uh, probably an atheist is, is probably a, a good way to describe him. But one of his most famous concepts is, uh, what does not kill me makes me stronger. And this, of course, has been made famous in our generation by Kelly Clarkson and not philosopher Kanye West. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's a, we don't read books like Nietzsche. I don't have time for that. So we listen to rap songs. Okay, so that that doesn't kill me can only make me stronger. 
I think there's some truth in this statement, but I think it's only true if we actually process our pain well. Because I think sometimes for us, we can have pain happen to us, and then we start to limit ourselves because we haven't dealt with it. We haven't gone through it. We, you know, we, we put on our nice church clothes, we put on our makeup, and we try to look all pretty and pretend like everything's all good. But inside, man, we're, we're like, we're, we can be tormented souls. We can have a lot going on. And here's what, I'm, here's what I've come to encourage you today, is that God does not define you by your past. You can be free in him. And, and here's the thing. You, you might be like, well, Jonathan, I just, I just don't know. I've tried in the past. I've tried. I don't know what to do. Well, here's the thing. Start with this. Start by knowing who God is. Start by knowing who he says you are. Start by allowing him to define your life. Start there and then move to a place where you're honest and open and transparent with your past hurts, with your past pain. You know, there's sometimes... You have to go through it. You have to be open with it. And sometimes what this might look like for us, can, can, we just, can we not be afraid in the Christian community anymore of counseling? Like this is a tool God has given us to help us find freedom. Can we be open about mental health issues? Can we, can we say that, that God heals the physical and the mental? And I, God can do anything. I think we've got to start being open and honest about this. I think we've got to process the pain of our past and, be, and, and find freedom from that. There is freedom that God wants to give to us. You know, I even think about this for some of our own past disappointments. You know, many of us were, were excited about this new uh, building expansion and what could come, and, and we just have all this hopes and dreams of what if a hurting Rochester community could come in? What if more people could find hope? What if more people could find grace? What if more people could find the hope of Jesus Christ? And so we get all excited and fired up, and, and that's where I'm at. But some of us have some real disappointments in the past from previous church building projects that didn't go how we had hoped they would go. And so we're fearful about the future rather than hopeful. And maybe we've got both things going on right at the same time. I'm not sure where you're at, but I think this is something we've got to be open about. We've got to talk about. And, and we're even going to have space for this in, in life groups. We've got a big old lobby. Talk, talk to somebody about these things. Or, or maybe, it's even, maybe it's even, hey, you know, in order for us to accomplish these big dreams and goals that we have, we've been talking about we're going to have to give up some of our financial resources. And, and maybe for you, every time Pastor Bob gets up and he starts saying, guys, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to make some financial sacrifices. You feel something internally. And you're like, you know what? I've always known it. Churches really are just really about money. I know they're up there saying it's about Jesus and reaching their community, but really, churches are, they're always about your money. They're always about your pocketbooks. Nothing ever changes. Here's some things we got to wrestle through, church. We, if we don't deal with that, what's the potential we could miss out on? It's, there's a lot at stake for our futures. But what if we could be a community that was open and honest and transparent, raw, and real. Maybe it would look a little messier. I'm okay with that. We're okay with that. Because for us, we, we want to be this place. We can be open with our struggles, open with our past, bring it to God, bring it to others, and find healing. I love this passage in uh, James. I want to say chapter 5. It might be chapter 3. Go home and read them both, and then you can find out where it's at. Um, <laughs> it says this, though. It says this somewhere in the Bible, okay? Um, <laughs> should have wrote this down. It says, confess your sins with your mouth, and you will be healed. Sometimes for us, we just need to let it out because it's been sitting inside for far too long. God doesn't want you to live with that bondage and that baggage. And church, there, there are stories of people in our community, of people in your lives, who are going through extreme darkness that Jesus wants to bring freedom to. And if we would 
open up the doors of our own past, our own disappointments, what if God could use that in amazing ways? I want to, um, I want to direct your attention actually to the screen. We're going to watch a story of what God did in one young person's life in our church. Years of years, from probably as early as eighth grade up until my senior year of high school and beyond that, with a really deep uh, depression and, and deep anxiety. And that all culminated in an attempt to take my own life when I was 17 years old. Leading up to my attempt, I just had an overwhelming sense of being alone. It was kind of like the world had lost all color. For the people around you to just have no idea what's going on inside, it just does something to a person. Um, and it, does something to, it did something to my relationship with God. I, I, in that time, I don't feel like I was close to God. Um, he was close to me, and I'm grateful for that, and that's the joy, but in the time, in the moment. I just started being attacked, like, in my mind. There were just, there were just lies upon lies of God isn't real, you're not worthy, you're not loved, you're not cared about, and it was just over and over and over again until I decided that there was that nothing else made sense to me than to, to attempt to take my life. Moving forward, I began to really do some very practical things. Um, I started going to counseling um, an hour, individually, individual sessions, an hour every week, and then group sessions for two hours every week. So that's three hours of counseling every single week for two years. It was, it was hard work, but it was, it was very important work. And I would say that that was like the foundation of where God healed me and how God healed me. I couldn't, there was no way I could go around my healing. Like I had to, I had to go into the darkest parts of my soul and sit there. Um, this place, this church, Calvary Assembly, I never thought that this would be where I would end up, where I would find my home. Uh, I grew up Catholic and that was a beautiful part of my life, but um, this place became my home. It became the place where I learned about who God is where I learned what real love is, what that's supposed to look like. God walked with me every step of the way through my healing, through every single disappointment. I cannot thank the Lord enough for just making my life more full and beautiful and joyful than I ever thought it could be. I, I, I didn't think, I thought maybe I could get through my depression and learn how to cope, but I didn't think I could have joy. I didn't think that I could have peace. And I'm so grateful that he brought that to me, that he brought me just a life that is colorful again, a life that I can just, I can just breathe and I, I don't have to feel weight. Like I, I can't explain what that's like, that freedom that comes from, from God, from encountering Him. And when I, when I lead worship, that's, what, that's where I'm coming from. Like I'm coming from this place of, of, wow God, you showed up. You showed up when nobody else did. But my, I tell this story, I tell the story of who I am but how I live my life is my life that's not because of anything I do that's good or bad, but because of the love that surrounds me, that's the testimony of God's goodness in my life. And that's the testimony of, of this place.
I remember visiting Lexi right after this happened um, at the mental health clinic at the hospital and the emotions that, that came along with that as my wife and I saw you there. And I think of what God has done in the last six years of your life. And I cannot say thank you to God enough. I'm grateful for his strength and his courage in your life. Church, this is what's at stake. This is what we have in front of us. This is the opportunity that God has given to us. We can find freedom, and we can even help others find freedom. Church, this is what I long for for us. God has given us his word with marvelous promises. I want us to write those truths on our hearts. He has given us his spirit. He has said, I will always be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And he has given us each other, community. We are not alone. We can do this together. We can find freedom in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to end today by going to the Lord. I, I want to end in prayer. And so actually, we're going to actually do a prayer all together. So if you have your note sheet out, you can, you can go ahead and grab that. We're going to do a, this exercise together. This is more than an exercise. This is an opportunity for us to call on the great healer. So you can write this out. I'm going to give you a minute to process this. But this is what um, I want you to think about is, and fill this in at the end of this sentence. God, would you give me the strength to overcome? And I want you to fill in what you would like God to do in your life to help you overcome from your past. Maybe there's a pain or a struggle that you've been thinking about this morning. I want to encourage you to write that down. Bring it to God. Ask him to show you what's true about himself. And then secondly, to fill this out, God, would you use the pain of my past too? I want you to fill that in. Think about what God wants to do to redeem what was once broken. To put back together the pieces that you thought were thrown away. Then church, I'm going to invite you to stand and Here's going to be the temptation. This is something that's deeply personal. And so we are going to read this out together and read out either what you thought about or what you wrote out. And we're going to say it out loud together. That could, we confess with our mouths to, for healing. Okay? We're going, to, we're going to read this first phrase together, and then we're going to fill it in. Would you pray this out loud boldly and confidently? You don't have to worry. The people around you are saying it too. They're not listening to you. Let's read this together. God, would you give me the strength to overcome? And secondly, God, would you use the pain of my past to help them find freedom? Lord Jesus, we're believing this in faith here this morning. We can't do this on our own. We've tried before and it hasn't worked. So Lord, we come to you with hearts longing for freedom from our past, from our bondage. Lord, would you allow us to leave our disappointments on the altar and instead turn our trust to you? Lord, you have been faithful. You are with us. We're thankful for your promises. But we need you, Lord, to fill us up to bring light into the places of our souls that just feel dark. And then, Lord, that you would use those stories of hope and redemption. You would allow us to process that with others so that they may find hope and freedom. We're believing in this. We're longing for this. And we're trusting in this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.